with a quick show of hands. So hands up, who read Enid Blyton's books as a child? Okay, that's quite a lot of you. Uh, what about Roald Dahl's books? Okay, also quite a lot of you. So when I work with children in the Youth Academy in Galway, and I ask them, what children's authors do they like to read? What are their favorite authors? Blyton and Dahl are always mentioned. I also work with children's studies students at the University of Galway, and last year I asked them to name the children's authors that they know and to try and include at least one children's author in that list. 86% of them could not name a single Irish children's author. And this reveals an issue. And it's an issue that organizations like Children's Books Ireland and projects like Discover Irish Kids Books are well aware of that many children in Ireland cannot name a children's author from Ireland or living in Ireland. And it also brings up an interesting question, and it's a question that I'm interested in. Why are we still reading 20th century British children's books in <laughs> <laughs> instead of more Irish children's authors? Is it partly nostalgia? Do we have a strong sense of nostalgia for these authors like Blyton and Dahl because maybe our grandparents read them as children, our parents may have read Blyton and Dahl, we read Blyton and Dahl when we were younger, and so we wish to pass on the books that we loved to the next generation of children. Totally understandable. And it's not an issue that children are reading older books, of course not. But when we look a little bit closer at some of the content of some of Blyton and Dahl's books, we do begin to see some problematic racial and colonial ideas. Now, revisions have been made to these authors' books to update the language and to edit out some of the racist content. But in the revised editions, some of the colonial and racial ideas persist. So I'm going to start off with some of the more lighthearted changes to Enid Blyton's books. Maybe you might have read the Magic Faraway Tree series when you were younger, where the tree children, this is maybe like a big moment of nostalgia for a lot of the people in the audience. You may have uh, you read these books where the tree children, Joe, Bessie, and Fanny, travel to different worlds uh, through climbing this Magic Faraway Tree. Their names in revised editions have been changed to Joe, Beth, and Franny. You may remember uh, one of the characters called Dame Slap in these stories, a, a violent school mistress. She has been changed to Dame Snap. So instead of physically punishing the children, she now just verbally scolds them. It's not so bad. <laughs> you may have read the Adventure Series books, where one of the few adult characters that the children actually like, called Bill Smugs, he used to enjoy a nice cigarette before bed. Recently, this has been changed to a far healthier glass of lime juice. So these revisions, they're all understandable, you know, because the meaning of words has changed since the 20th century. Hence the name change from Fanny to Franny and from Cousin Dick to Cousin Rick. And also, corporal punishment with children, definitely no longer okay. So we need to change her name, and definitely not okay to portray cigarettes as cool in children's books. And these revisions also solve the problems. So it's not just Dame Slap's name that has been changed. Her behavior has changed as well. She doesn't hit the students anymore. And Bill Smugs has not switched to vaping in the modern editions of the adventure <laughs> series. However, there are other revisions made to Enid Blyton's books and other 20th century children's authors like Roald Dahl that actually fail to solve the problems that prompted the revisions in the first place. So I'll start with an example that may be familiar to you. Last year, you may have heard about or read about the announcement of changes to Roald Dahl's books. Um, so Puffin, the publisher, decided that they would edit out some of the descriptive terms used in his books like fat and ugly. And they also decided to remove the references to characters' skin color, but not just human character skin color, animal and fantasy characters too. So, in James and the Giant Peach, the silkworm was originally white and thin, 
the silkworm is now frail and thin. The earthworm once had lovely pink skin, it now has lovely smooth skin. And Miss Spider's large, black, murderous-looking head is now a large, murderous-looking head. So we can see from these examples, what's the similar pattern? Color. Color is key. And it's not the first time that Roald Dahl's books have been changed due to descriptions of characters' skin color. If we go all the way back to 1964 and the publication of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, we see that the workers in Wonka's factory are not Oompa Loompas, they are black African pygmies who were found in the very deepest and darkest part of the African jungle where no white man had ever been before. And this is a direct quote from the original book. Willy Wonka, recognizing a potential source of cheap labor in these poor, hungry Africans, smuggled them over in large packing cases with holes to England. Now, this draws exceptionally clear parallels with colonialism and a white savior narrative and with the slave trade. In 1974, the book was criticized, understandably, for reinforcing stereotypes about slavery. Dahl strongly disagreed with the criticism, but very reluctantly, he did decide to make changes to enhance the fantasy elements of the story. So what he did was, he changed the black African pygmies to Oompa Loompas from Loompa Land. He also changed the workers from black to white. So distancing the book from its links with the British Empire, with colonialism and with the slave trade. Even though the, these revisions are made, the underlying colonial ideas of the original still persist because the Oompa Loompas still live in thick jungles infested by the most dangerous beasts in the entire world. And they are still a tribe who do not learn English until they come to Britain. So the revisions do not change the underlying racial and colonial messages. Over the last 20 or so years, Blyton's publishers have followed a similar editing pattern where references to characters' skin color and their race is removed or changed somehow. And we see this, this process most clearly in the adventure series. So I'm going to sh show you two examples from the adventure series. The first one is The Island of Adventure, the first book of the series, published in 1944. In this book, we have a character called Jojo. He's a black man, and he is the servant to the white English family in the story. In the original, he is described as a colored man whose skin was black, and he rolled his eyes in a peculiar way. Jojo is considered intellectually inferior to the white English family, and Dina, one of the child protagonists, refers to him as even more stupid than before. There is a strong sense of possessiveness in the way the white family speak about Jojo. They call him our black servant. The family grow increasingly impatient with Jojo's strangeness and his laziness, and they say he's really getting impossible. And in a clear evocation of colonial language, they say he is so uncivil. In revised editions from the 21st century, Jojo's name has been changed to Joe. He is no longer a colored man or a black man. He is a strange man whose skin was lined, his teeth were very white, and his eyes darted from side to side as he looked at them. So all references to black, colored, erased. So from the publisher's perspective, Problem solved, racism gone. But if we look at how Jojo speaks and how he still speaks in the revised editions, we see that he speaks with a, a very strong accent and his use of double negatives sets him out and marks him out as different from the other characters. And his speech pattern also mirrors other black African-American characters in other 19th and 20th century children's books like Jim in Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, who says, I couldn't get nothing else. Uncle Remus in The Burr Rabbit Tales, who says, I don't know nothing about that. And here we have Jojo in Blyton's book, saying, Miss Polly, she didn't say nothing about any friends. No, she didn't. His speech style is preserved. In the edition from 2014 and 2022, he still speaks like Jim and like Uncle Remus. As well as this, he is still positioned as inferior 
to the white English characters, and he still calls one of the child protagonists, Philip, Master Philip. We see the same thing again in the final book of the series, called The River of Adventure, from 1955. Now, this story, Blyton sets it in an imaginary country called Barira. But Barira is given a real geographical location because Blyton tells us that it's set in a country beside Syria. The inhabitants of this country are described as having very brown skin. And the children think that they look like Arabs or something. In the revised editions, brown skin is removed, Arabs is removed, but the story is still set in this country beside Syria. So we, the reader, and the child reader, still know whereabouts this story is. The book has been extensively edited to remove the really problematic racist elements. But the Middle Eastern characters encountered in the story are still very much positioned as inferior to the white English family. So the children meet lots of different characters in this story, and one of the children they meet is called Ula. And Ula adores the white English family, especially the young boy, Philip, who he refers to originally as Lord. And in the revised editions, this has been changed to boss. But very clearly, the power dynamic has stayed the same. Ula pleads to be saved by Philip. And in his pleading, he promises, Ula, be servant. Ula, work for you. In the revised edition, servant is taken out. But the replacement of Ula be yours, Ula work for you, retains the characterization of Ula as property of Philip and the white family. He remains a subject willing to be owned. From these examples, we see that the white savior narrative and the clear master-subject relationship of these stories is preserved in modern editions. In the, the service level of these colorless new editions of the books could be considered as a, a, a positive, a progressive step, and an example maybe of post-racial children's literature. But what's actually happening is that characters who are now implicitly, rather than explicitly racialized, are still positioned as subordinate to white English characters. In Ireland, we have fantastic Irish children's authors who are diverse, who are inclusive, like Adiba Jaigadar, Sarah Webb, Owen Devore Dune, Dave Rudden, Oliver Jeffers, Chris Judge, Owen Colfer, the list goes on and on and on. And we should celebrate these authors. But what's happening is that they are often overshadowed by the likes of Blyton and Dal. Instead of perpetuating the dominance of older 20th century British children's authors, we should be encouraging children to read more contemporary and diverse and Irish children's authors and just be more aware of 20th century children's authors whose books contain deeply problematic and deeply, deeply embedded racial and colonial ideas. So nobody is asking for a ban, but maybe we need a better balance. Thank you.